beginning a conversation with a politician who has held many positions in this country and outside Ghana. He was a former Deputy Finance Minister, former Minister for Employment and Labour Relations, former CEO of National Petroleum Authority, former MP for NAPDAM constituency and economics, a former board member of Bank of Ghana. Uh, Honorable Musi Sasaga is my guest. Uh, Honorable Musi, you most welcome to Metro. Thank you very much. All right, so um, what would you say were your achievements at the National Petroleum Authority? Well, at the National Petroleum Authority, uh, one of the most important achievements was the fact that we were able to expand the private uh, participation in the downstream oil and gas and making sure that we have many more uh, indigenous companies who were registered to become more distribution companies. So that was a very major one because previously uh, it was only the oil trading companies that were bringing in products. But during my tenure uh, with the PDCs and the local participation, they could also bring in uh, products. Uh, another important area was the fact that we were able to mitigate the operation of uh, bath. Uh, because we, we, we had a division that we established that went down to do the inspection and check the quality of the uh, product. Uh, in addition, and the most important, was the fact that we liberalized during my time um, the pricing of petroleum products so that it would reflect uh, international commodity prices, i.e., food trade in particular. The exchange rates and the union rate. But most important is that I think them that magnificent uh, building around Fiesta Bay, almost a seven story building, which is an envy to another public sector companies. All right, so let's look at finance. Ghana has been downgraded by the international rating agencies Fitch, Rubek, SP Global, and other. Uh, international rating agencies from B plus in 2016 to further status. Honorable, what are your views on these rating ratings uh, by the international rating agencies? Well, that is rating agencies, as you have mentioned, um, they are there to look at the economic health of various countries and when they get the warning signals um, that uh, your your microeconomic situation is changing, then they can be, and some of the ratings that they will use will be your debt to um, uh, expenditure issues. They will also look at your assets. They will also look at your borrowing capacity. They will also look at your reserves. And they will also look at your balance of payments. And when all these are distorted, then they revise your rating. Now, revising your rating downwards means that your economy is not being delivered, and they are the authorities. So, some of us were not surprised when we were downgraded from the B in the 2016 to the C classes and the jump points. Would you say that these ratings were justified? Because government doesn't think that these ratings were justified. Yes, initially, the government thought that this way ratings were not justified, but some of those who have in-depth knowledge and have worked as financial analysts knew that they were quite in, in, in order. And uh, of course, with time, uh, they were justified and then exonerated because the government itself had now come out to admit that there have been a lot of economic distortions. The finance minister thinks that Africa needs its own rating agencies. I don't know what your view is on this matter. Well, it could be an innovation, but why should Africa have its own rating agencies when we all source from the same banks, uh, we, we look the same textbooks uh, in economics and in finance. So economics and finance is international and it is global, and then we must all you uh, by the same laws. So I don't think that having an African one would be quite good for us. What is this other um, uh, 
parameters that he is going to use to, to say that this is specific to Africa. And of course, we have other African countries that have been doing well and that have had very good ratings. Um, to what extent are you worried about our debt? The, according to Bank of Ghana's data, um, we have about 507. Five billion seats uh, external desktop. To what extent are you worried about this? Uh, this debt? Well, the debt is uh, worrying because we have to pay back. And uh, when the payback period is up and you have to default, then of course there are penalties. And if you cannot also pay back, it means you are creating debt into the future for future generations. And this can be very worrying. Especially when the money that have been borrowed have not been used for economic return projects and have been spent in the reckless manner. And I remember the president in his solar address was saying that they were not reckless. But uh, we need to see how the monies were, were used because if they were economic generating projects and not just political, they would not be where we are today. Um, is it fair to conclude that, and government has been consistent on that, that um, the poor economic indicators, you look at inflation, which is about 53.6%, you have our debt that is uh, 575 billion, monetary policy is around 28%. These indicators, government thinks that it is as a result of uh, Ukraine and uh, Ukraine Russia war and COVID 19 um, pandemic. Is it fair to attribute these four economic indicators to Russia and Ukraine war and COVID 19? Well, I think before even the uh, COVID 19, we were already seeing the signs that the economy was actually going to be in trouble. And mostly it was because of the COVID. Uh, we already said that um, the, the debt to GDP ratio was very high, and that was a very strong indicator. And as at that time, it wasn't COVID. Uh, they borrowed before COVID and borrowed after COVID. If anything, COVID rather brought in some traditional $100 million from the World Bank and other external sources. So I think that it was just the mismanagement of the economy. And when they talk of Ukraine, uh, first of all, what is our trading relationship with uh, Ukraine? And I'm sure some analysis was done, and it was barely like maybe 5% uh, between Ghana and Ukraine. So why would we use Ukraine as uh, the basis? Uh, I do agree that Ukraine also created a problem with crude uh, oil prices going up, and of course that affected but again, the price in Ghana is not only related to just the international food price, but also to our city. Our city was five cities to the dollar. So if we mismanage the economy, it is now 13 cities to the dollar, and the price of food goes to 15 cities per liter, we don't blame it on Ukraine. And again, are we the only isolated country? Our next door neighbor is Côte d'Ivoire. And Cote d'Ivoire didn't experience all these shocks that we have been experiencing. And I can quote the uh, 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 Vice President Baumia when somewhere in 2015, 2016, he was likening Ghana to Cote d'Ivoire. That uh, why is that Cote d'Ivoire having experienced certain um, economic distortions? So the same explanation goes that there are economies that are still very stable, like Kenya. There are also African countries. So I don't think that it is because, or solely because of the COVID and also the Ukraine war. There are calls for the economic management team led by the Vice President to be dissolved. You think the economic management team should be dissolved? Yes, I think that because they have failed the means and they have also embarrassed and disgraced the Vice President, Dr. Mahmoud Kaumina, because he used to talk to them and said that they have the men. And if you claim you have the men, and those men now 
have not been able to manage the economy very well, and it is a failure, they have to be dissolved. Even including he himself as the chairman of the economic uh, management team. I don't think that they have any excuse to Ghanaians when they inherited an inflation of about, let's say, 11%, uh, and now it is 50%. They inherited an exchange rate of um, 5% to the CD, and it is now like 11 And then they inherited uh, other economic indi indicators that were very good, and now all have plummeted. They inherited an economy of B class, and now it is junk bonds. It's total failure. And when you fail, you are supposed to be disqualified. And that's why it's just like a football match. Um, if you call, call, concede a foul, it's a red card. And red card means you must leave. All right. Um, do you think the government should cut down budget ahead of um, IMF bailout? Yes. Uh, at least that has been the suggestion of some. Yes, uh, because if you look at our um, deficit, um, the deficit is very huge. A lot, a lot of it is just for salaries and wages. And uh, I don't think that and uh, for some of the flagship projects, which are really not tenable right now. And therefore, government must reduce the, the budget so that we can narrow the budget deficit. Because once we narrow the budget deficit, then there will be no need for government to go to Bank of Ghana to borrow either two T bills or some of the bonds that uh, they were floating. And, and that will give us uh, some bit of uh, fiscal um, space. But if you continue to spend when you don't have enough in your kitchen, uh, your, then, then that is quite worrying. And uh, I believe that the first point of cutting of expenditure is wages and salaries of uh, a lot of this. Uh, Bloated um, um, Jubilee House and presidential staffers and the ministers. I think that's where we must start. We cannot go to the IMF or to the bilaterals and say that look, we want to restructure our debt when we are not doing anything about our own expenditure. Can Ghana secure the IMF bailouts within the, the first quarter of 2023? We are in March. But we are in March already, so I don't know where the first quarter is coming again from. Mm -hmm. Right now, we know that there's the staff uh, agreements which have said that yes, we have come to collate all the information that is needed to justify the fact that Ghana needs uh, a bailout of three billion. But that is yet to go to the executive uh, directors and committee board approval. Yeah, for board approval. So, but it is not over because there are certain issues about the fact that they should cut expenditure has not yet been done. The IMF has also come up with functionalities which would include the fact that they should mobilize more domestic revenue, they should um, um, come up with some new taxes. And I know that into the next few weeks, there's going to be a number of taxes that will be coming to Parliament for approval. And this is even going to add more economic burden uh, to the good people of Ghana. Does it look like Ghana can survive without time and payment? We cannot at all. We, need we it. just need it. Mm -hmm. And that is why at the right time, about maybe a year ago, uh, some of us were telling the Minister of Finance that he must go to the IMF and that the IMF belongs to all of us. We are the shareholder of IMF and we are supposed to benefit from any IMF privileges and soft loans. But they told us that it was Ghana beyond it. They told us that it was something that they would never do. And the, the more we prompted them that they were going into the ditch and they needed to go to IMF, they thought that no, they could go uh, on the international uh, market, especially in Euro bonds and cover for all their uh, expenses. But now they have turned around and said they are going to IMF. And I thought that the first thing the finance minister should have done was to rather apologize to Ghanaians and to say that, look, I, I think I was very arrogant and uh, I shouldn't have done what I've done. 
there was a lot of experts advised to me, which I didn't listen to, and therefore I am apologizing before I go in for an IMF program. What do you think is the reason the president will not want to sack the finance minister, the current finance minister? Well, I just think that the, the whole thing is that, uh, first of all, he's a family member, and uh, they, they, they believe more in family and friends. Uh, secondly, uh, maybe the finance minister is the one who knows a lot of the secrets of how some of these loans that have been acquired have been misused. So probably if he's no longer on the seat, maybe a, a lot of issues may come up. So he has to keep him to protect uh, his inner circle. Do you agree with President Akufal when he said the finance minister Ken Oyata should secure the IMF deal first, then I can look at, I can consider the calls to dismiss him. Well, he, 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 he said it as a ploy, and then we have seen that uh, even if he secures it, uh, he's not going to change the finance minister. What's your view on the president's attitude towards reshuffling? Well, I think that uh, the, 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 the president feels that if he reshuffles the government, uh, there will be people who feel aggrieved, and these aggrieved people may want to talk uh, and go into town. And certain things may come out that will be very uncomfortable. Again, if he has to touch, maybe he has to touch some of his uh, friends and relatives, which again uh, he would not want to. And you know, the reshuffle can sometimes bring um, instability within the government sectors. So these are some of the things that he's protecting. But do you think that if he reshuffle, the market will have react, reacted? Well, if he reshuffled, especially the finance minister, then the market will act positively. Because they now know that they are bringing in somebody who, who can be competent enough to take us through these hardships that we are going through. I don't know what your view is on S. Krasha, the former president has been speaking. I want to find your view on what uh, your view is on S. Yeah. Krasha. He has suggested that uh, if he is re-elected as a president, he would scrap S. Krasha. Yes, uh, Article 71 of the yes. uh, S. Krasha is very, very controversial mm -hmm. and uh, it's a very uh, sensitive uh, topic. Mm -hmm. First of all, we need to know who are those who are covered in Article 71. Mm -hmm. Because people just think that it is members of parliament mm -hmm. and then former ministers and the rest. But I think that it goes beyond, it goes beyond that. that. Okay. So, so now, if we are going to manage Article 71, uh, what are we going to do? What was the purpose of Article 71? Why was an ex Russia instituted for the Article 71 beneficiaries. But I think that what the former President Mahama was trying to argue to was that there are certain Article 71 that could be excluded. And uh, that, that could be, for example, ministers could be excluded from Article uh, 71. So for me, it's going to be a review and not a total cancellation or scrapping it. There are those who think that he was uh, a member of parliament and he took S. Gratia, he became a vice president, he took S. Gratia. He became a president, a former president, he took S. Gratia. Do you yes. think it is fair to say he should return the S. Gratia? Yes, yeah, they the said uh, the law is not neutral. It's okay. Active, okay. So based on that, I don't think that anybody should be told to, 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 to return it. But we are looking into the future. It means if he now becomes the next president, which he will become, then definitely he's not going to be sure president. about that. Yes, I'm very sure about that. Yes, so in that case, he's telling Amir that um, this is what I'm now going to do. I'm going to make sure that the Article 71 and the Ex-Gratia is reviewed so that we will see how um, it can be managed alongside wages and salaries. But you don't think he should uh, 
return what he has already taken. No, the Lord no. Allah. no, because as I said, the Lord is retroactive. Mm. Because in the same day, if I didn't benefit for some privileges when I was an MP, now that I'm not an MP, if they now have certain good conditions, I will not say that now my conditions should be given to me. Mm. Yes, because it didn't apply to me. Alright, what, what's your view on the new CIA by the EC that is seeking to make Ghana card the sole registration document? What it means is that if you don't have the Ghana card, you cannot register as a voter. Well, first of all, Ghana card is an important document to make sure that we know who are Ghanaians. And therefore, for me, if you have to use Ghana card to be a basis, able to identify ourselves in any aspect of our life in Ghana, uh, it is worth it. Now when it comes to the election, we already have the voters ID and that is what is what we need to use for identification during the voting uh, process. Now I don't think that uh, people are against the CI that uh, People should not use the, the national card for identification. It is the procedure of procuring it that people have talked about. I, the time that I was paying for my national ID card, I just went to my polling station or my electoral area, I queued and I got it. Now they are saying that in the new form of it, it has to be at the district headquarters. And I think that is where the problem is, uh, because going to the district headquarters can really create a lot of challenges, mm. because our rural people are scattered all around, and therefore to be able to go to a district uh, will be quite uh, cumbersome. There are those who are of the view that using Ghana card as the sole document for registration, voter registration, will disenfranchise of the people. Because as we speak, and the NIA is very clear that about 3.5 million people do not have the Ghana card. I don't know what <coughs> Yes, so it is for this reason. Because first of all, it is slow in getting the Ghana card. So if something is slow in getting, you cannot now say that it should be the ultimate that should be used for you to be identified to vote. That's why some of us are saying that, look, first of all, streamline the acquisition of the data card without any bottlenecks. Secondly, make it available. Thirdly, we should acquire it either from our polling station or our electoral area. And that one, I mean, people find it easier to just walk to their polling station or to their electoral area. But if you have to walk these long distances, it will be difficult for the rural constituencies and districts. The argument has been advanced that the NIA is an agency under national security. In other words, it's an agency under the president. And the president whose party is the new patriotic party is a beneficiary of the electoral process. So why should an independent body, which is supposed to be an, a, a neutral arbiter in all matters, will rely on uh, an agency that that would uh, that would also benefit from the electoral process? That is a difficulty for some. Yeah, I agree to that because the, the independence of whether the EC etc. Uh, has been. And we are talking about data here. We are relegated mm. to some other powers. And uh, we have to make sure that the EC is still independent. We have to make sure that the um, ID system, they are also quite independent so that there will be transparency. So I agree with those who say that look, try to subsume it under some other layers of powers that should not be the best. But it takes a really there. Independence and those that they want to subsume them into are also beneficiaries of it, mm -hmm. so they are likely to pollute and make sure that it is to their advantage. Under 
the new SEA that the Electoral Commission is proposing, the EC intend to scrap the guarantor system. Because when you have a guarantor, two guarantors, you can go to the station and they guarantee for you. Which the EC is seeking to scrap. There are those and your, your party in parliament, your MPC in parliament are against that. that the guarantor system is time tested and should not be scrapped. What's the issue? Yes. It should not be scrapped. Yes. Because the part of the, the, the rural constituencies in the district, they do know one another very well. And therefore, when you are in the queue, uh, a cousin, an uncle, an auntie can testify that this person is from this house, this person is from here. And so for us, that type of guarantee, it, it is, uh, it, to me, it is very well accepted. Um, Honourable, you were a former, you were a former deputy finance minister, mm -hmm. and uh, when it comes to auditing and uh, such issues, you are very passionate about it. So the auditor general has published the COVID-19 expenditure. The, there are suggestions that it is wrong for the auditor general to publish the COVID-19 expenditure ahead of the hearing of the. Public Accounts Committee. You were an MP, a former deputy finance minister. What's your view on these issues? Well, for me, I think that uh, these things are case by case, mm -hmm. and uh, I find that wrong if they publish it uh, before the hearing of the public uh, affairs, uh, the Public Accounts Committee. Mm -hmm. The reason why I'm saying so is that that is why it's called public. So public is supposed to know. So if even the bigger public, which is really the Ghanaian public, we have even been given the opportunity to know about it. If we think that there are issues with it, I think it is even a better forum and a better platform than just the parliamentary uh, public accounts committee. The, the Attorney General, of Dami, is of the view that it is wrong to publish the COVID-19 expenditure even before the public accounts committee begins here. Yes, but just the same way that when there are successes, mm -hmm. they even uh, announce them before they even bring them to parliament. And that one there is no complaint. Mm -hmm. you know, but uh, I think that there was this point uh, of the IMF and the politics. Um, and uh, I thought that there was a little point that we didn't dwell on. Mm -hmm. I said it was just the IMF. But we also have the external creditors, which is the public. And uh, in the Paris Club, uh, Ghana is owing almost about uh, 1.9 billion mm -hmm. And this means mm -hmm. the G20. Yeah, the G20. Yeah. And now there's going to be an extended facility by the G20. First of all, it is very, very disgraceful and miserable to Ghana mm -hmm. that we are now applying for that G20 uh, extended facility. And the members on it are are not very prosperous uh, countries. These are countries that we have always considered to be impoverished countries. Mm. So for example, Ethiopia, we can understand their war ravage, you know, there is drought, there is crisis there, and if they are going for such a facility, Chad is also on that route, and of course Zambia. And I kind of want to join that kind of league. Mm. I thought that John, John should joining a league where we are now called a middle income country that is growing. And, and, and I feel embarrassed. Uh, Cote d'Ivoire have not joined it. Uh, Kenya have not joined it. South Africa have not joined it. So again, it tells you the deep crisis that uh, Ghana is into. And I was even disappointed mm -hmm. that the president in the State of the Nation address would be blaming some diplomatic uh, envoys, the German, the, the, the German. Mm -hmm. The first thing is, did the German uh, ambassador come to the government? It is the government that went to the German ambassador mm -hmm. to say that, look, can you help us? So if you come to me and say, can, I, can you help me to get your finance minister in Germany to put a case across? I also have to tell you some of the things that you need to do in Germany. Mm -hmm. 
And some of it included the fact that they must cut down on their expenditure. For me, I thought that this was free consultancy that the government should rather uphold rather than coming to accuse them of meddling into uh, the internal affairs of Canada. Honorable, does, does it look like um, we will be able to secure debt cancellation from China and other uh, economies that we own? Because that is what the president has been pushing for. Yes, that is what he's been begging for China uh, and other uh, countries to cancel our debts. Yes, so, so for the example, uh, with China, we are talking of almost 1.7 billion. Mm -hmm. Okay. But again, what is the method that we are going to use with China? And that is why the German ambassador was saying that, look, I will get the German finance minister to see whether they can arrange a meeting with the authorities of China, especially the Ministry of Finance. You know, so that would have been a way by which we could be moving towards that. But if you now come up to then say that, no, you are not happy with the German ambassador, and then how could you move through? And again, if you look at China, uh, during the Ukraine-Russian war, when they were voting uh, at the UN or wherever, mm -hmm. uh, China in particular abstained and had a neutral ground. Ghana voted uh, against okay. Russia. Now, uh, they say my enemy is, my enemy's friend is my enemy, for example. Uh, so the, the country that uh, uh, China was very sympathetic to is the country that Ghana voted against. Did you know? Then now, uh, I thought we should have abstained from voting against uh, uh, Russia. Because we are in the non aligned movement. Mm -hmm. It is not good for us. But looking at it carefully, going for debt cancellation, is that the only option left for us? We don't yeah. have any other option. Yeah, that's the only then option. We might be in a very deep crisis. We are in a deep crisis because he picked was a problem mm -hmm. during the first time. And it doesn't repeat itself often. Mm -hmm. So th this is the only method. And there should be a lot of economic diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And we must put aside arrogance and then use talks. I have been monitoring the Transparency International's um, Corruption Perception Index. And uh, the figures are there for everybody to see. What's your view on our fight against corruption? Well, I think that uh, we have not been very successful in corruption mm -hmm. across various governments. You know, and it's not only this particular government. But this particular government has rather deepened the corruption. You know. And for me, there's no small corruption and big corruption. So all that we need to do is to make sure that um, the agencies that have been put, especially you and the rest, are given the necessary teeth to act. And then the special prosecutor should come out very, very strong, including um, the auditor general. Yes. Your party has um, been boycotting the, the party advisory committee of the, uh, which in the past was used by Dr. Ferrigan to resolve so many issues. I don't know what your view is on these issues. They have a concern, isn't it? Well, they have a, a concern, but I don't think that our concern should be perpetual. Uh, I think that when you raise the you need to look at whether the petition has been rejected. If our concern that uh, the EC and the inter-party uh, don't really take on board our proposals and suggestions, mm. then that one we can boycott. And I think that was the reason why we boycotted previously. I now want to know whether now have things changed, you know, have we tested the waters again? Because also there's a disadvantage
separately that uh, the Interparty Adoration Committee has been reduced to information delivery platform with that consultation with the, the biggest opposition party. And so there is no need to go to that forum and just listen to whatever the easy is really. Yes, but that is what I'm saying. Where do we stop from? Mm -hmm. You know, they have we really again tried to really engage the EPC to say that look, this was the reasons why we stopped coming. Are you guaranteeing us any fair treatment into the future? Mm -hmm. So so that we will now revise our notes and then see what we can do to bring into party a good relationship. I still think that occasionally because we are not at the meeting, certain decisions are taken that can be taken against us. What should be done ahead of 2024 as far as issues of uh, the NDC not going to IPAC? Yes. I, I still think that we, we, we need to dialogue with EC because EC is very important and uh, I don't think that there is any person who can be forever at a moment. EC might have made mistakes previously, but it doesn't mean that if you sit with EC and you discuss with EC, we cannot see a new situation into the future. And I have been thinking that we still need to bring the electoral commissioner on board. We need to sit with her, talk with her, and tell her she is not our enemy. It is the processes that we are not happy with. Can you find a way, you know, Is it that striking that um, more often than not the party that is in power seems to be agreeing with, uh, with the DC and I'm not referring to only the NPP government. I mean if the NDC is in power, the opposition which is the NPP seems to have some problems with the electoral commission. And then the NDC goes to position and then the NDC also have problems with the EC. What what are we not really right? Well, I thought that Afarijan did everything right. Mm. Yes, and uh, the legacy of Afarijan gave fair treatment to all the political parties, whether you were in opposition or you were in, in government. Mm. And therefore, the current electoral uh, commission bosses should go back and see how Afarijan managed to, you know, uh, to manage the situation at the electoral commission. Said that there was a win-win situation for all the political parties. There was no time that during Afrikaans' time we could see an opposition party really coming up very hostile. But this is because he did what was right. He never favored the government party nor the opposition party. And our current EC to just go back to Afrikaans and sit with him and say, you are my uncle, how did you do it, and how can we learn from you? You, you think there are lessons that children can learn from, Dr. Oh, yes, I think so. Yes. Uh, first of all, Afarita made sure the electoral commission did not look like a monster. Mm -hmm. And in the hours on... Is yes. that what we have now? Oh, yes, yes. You are so scared. Uh, people, it is very opaque. You know, it's not very transparent. Even the kind of echo that they will even bring when they are meeting people in parliament mm -hmm. that can be quite uh, serious. But if you looked at uh, Afarijan, he was simple. Any time we invited him to the uh, finance committee to come and um, defend his budget, he was free flowing with us and uh, he gave us his points and we argued here and there. And at the end of the day, we came to an amicable solution. And Afarijan was also somebody that we could approach and go to discuss with him uh, some of the problems or some of the gains that he has brought. And, and he was a free-flowing person. I can see that this particular electoral commission is very tight. You know, it's like I can't deal with the, the, the NDC. She's not friendly, you know, and for an electoral commission, when you want to carry everybody on board, mm. then you should be a bit friendly. 
For example, when Afaritan was brought to one of the uh, during a post election to come and make his statement. You mean at the Supreme Court? At the Supreme Court. Okay. He was very the witness box. Yeah. Witness box, he was smiling, he was amenable for to all parties. He just delivered what he thought was right. With someone like in Mensa, I didn't see it. A lot of security around there. Uh, you can't even see her face. Uh, and she won't sit and stand in the box. When you do that, then you are creating a monster out of a friendly electoral commission. What's your view on the domestic debt exchange being implemented by the finance minister? Can you comment? Well, I, I think that uh, uh, they, they have created problems and then they want an end. And people like me who have bonds or whatever to now come and be the people to solve their reckless borrowing and their reckless expenditure. And I'm saying it with uh, seriousness because all these euro bonds, they were transaction advices. These transaction advices took fees, commissions, and commissions. Their fees and commissions have not been tapped. They have won 100% with their uh, commissions and fees. Then I, the one who voluntarily decided that I'm going to invest, then I'm the one suffering. And when it comes to even the haircut, even they don't even negotiate with me, and they give me a fiat of 30% haircut. Meanwhile, what of the transaction advisory fees and commission? You think of as, uh, uh, consultation was missing as far as? Oh yes, yes, because if I'm an investor, uh, just like at the time that I was going to invest, you know, you, you, you had a brochure that convinced me that if I invest, this would be my interest, this would be the due date for maturity, etc. So, you told me the interest rates that would be available. So, in the same way, if you are now in crisis, you need to come and sit with me and also explain to me your crisis and then tell me, look, you want to do a haircut of 30. Then I can say, no, 30 is not good enough. I would prefer a haircut of 20. Mm -hmm. But what they did was a fiat. Yes. But the government promised that they were going to start paying uh, coupons and principles of uh, the old bonds. They promised to start yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, my check with the Pensioner Bondholders Forum is that the money has not hit the accounts. Yeah. I don't know what your view is. Well, uh, I'm not surprised. Uh, for, for example, in my case, I invested with uh, fund managers, mm -hmm. and that was around 2017, yeah. when they came out to say that they were cleaning uh, the banks and also cleaning yeah, some case fund managers. Now. Yes, yes. And then they divided us into what they call tier 1 and tier 2. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, part of my investment fell into the tier two. Last November they were supposed to come and pay us 25%. They've not been paid anything. And now they are not even talking about it. So if bondholders are also saying that no money has hit their accounts, then I, I tend to believe because they set up GCB capital and AM capital for we those who lost our money to fund managers, which was supervised by the Securities Exchange Commission. Up to now, exactly. nobody is talking to us. Mm -hmm. I know a number of people who are on pension because at the time that they were investing, some of them were like 58 years old. So they were kept in tier two. Then immediately now, two years down the road, they have now become 60, 61, 62. So they are now pensioners, but their money has been locked in tier two. And no payment has been done. What are the implications? Is there any um, avenue for investors to take on government or local government? Uh, I think the only way is to mobilize and to start picketing mm -hmm. like the pensioners did. Mm -hmm. It looks like the government will only listen to you if 
you are hard and you are demonstrating, but if you are gentle and you are quiet, mm -hmm. then the thing that will work for you, your case should lie low for some time. But do, do you think it was right for government to even attempt to uh, touch pension funds and uh, bonds of uh, individual and pensioner bondholders? They made that attempt, which yeah, has to be resisted. Yeah. So you saw. The Chief Justice and uh, former Chief Justice of Ayakufo has to join the people. Yes. Uh, okay. Of course, once you start touching the individuals, because people have planned their life, and when you plan your life, your plan goes for things like your health needs, school fees of your children, and other social costs that comes to you. Your, 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 your housing, your utilities. So you cannot plan your life based on certain expectations and suddenly you are told that you no longer have money mm -hmm. and that your money has been restructured and uh, uh, it will be given to you as and when they deem fit. When they didn't know your expenditure profile. Mm -hmm. so, so that really brought difficulties and therefore pensioners are to, uh, to, to, to come up. So, you saw the former chief judge Subayaku for picketing with the pensioners. Yeah. Were you impressed? Well, especially Sophia Akufo, mm. whom I have known when she was a lawyer, she was with Mughal lawyer, she became chief justice and the rest. This is a principled woman. Mm. And she understands the law and she knows that when you enter into a bond uh, investment, mm. it, it is like a and that is exactly what the finance minister was doing. And because she has that legal mind mm -hmm. of saying that I want my rights to prevail, that she had to come out. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, no, the, there are suggestions that um, Ghana's 66 independence shouldn't have been celebrated at all because uh, we were celebrating the independence at the time Ghana was short of uh, childhood vaccines for uh, six child killer diseases, measles, and others. What's your view on that? Well, me, I have a mixed feeling on that. Mm. Uh, I really enjoy SIF much, mm. and I would always want us to celebrate it. Mm. But in saying so, if we now know that there is a very important um, challenge, especially disease that is affecting children, Babies, then maybe we should have looked at it and cut down the expenditure mm. for the celebration and not the way it is going. But I would also not say that we shouldn't have celebrated at all. At least there should be signals that um, the fight and the political independence that Pam Improvement got for us, we appreciate it and we are very happy uh, we are a, 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 a nation. Uh, I, I have listened to uh, former Chief Justice of Ayakufo on this matter yes. and her views were clear that there is no need for that celebration. That money could have been channeled to building hospitals or uh, improving lives of people. Uh, former President Mahama has made the same comment that it, it is not necessary to celebrate independence in the manner we do if we cannot get the Yes, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. But if the economy is doing very well, there's no, mm -hmm. uh, we should be able to celebrate. Mm -hmm. But if the economy is not doing well like it is now, mm -hmm. then you have to look at very critical areas that are in need of uh, resources mm -hmm. and, and rather target it there. But for me, if the economy is doing well and which to do well, when John Mahama comes into government, definitely we should be Seem to Honourable, you, you, you seem to be very certain about um, the re-election of the, the president, the former president. Oh, yes. I'm very certain. And because you, know, you, are not, you are not done with even the internal contestants. Oh, but, but that one, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I'm an insider. Mm -hmm. you, you know, some of us, we are not like uh, ivory tower politicians. Mm -hmm. uh, as you see me, I always go to my constituency, I go to the rural areas, so I know exactly what is happening. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
the, the rank and file, almost about 90% plus of NDC supporters mm -hmm. think that John Mark must come on board. And uh, I, I see that with them. Uh, this is our best candidate and we cannot wish it away at all. But, but that, that is the internal context about that which you face. No, no, but but after th that, that internal contest, mm -hmm. the other one is easier. Oh, okay. Yes, the other one is easier because you can't make the economy this way and say that you are coming to win an election. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you taking Ghanaians for granted? Okay. All right. And when they were debating that uh, mm -hmm. APC of Nigeria has won, has won, I was just surprised that they were only using that example. Mm -hmm. But they didn't use Lula who has also won in Brazil. Okay. Because Lula is like John Mahama. Mm -hmm. He was the president, he lost an election, he came again, he lost an election, and he has come. And they, they, they have voted him. That's why they are silent about it. Yeah, did you monitor the Nigeria election? I did. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do you think that there are lessons to, to learn from the Nigeria election? Ahead of 2024. Yes, I, uh, what I learned from the Nigerian election, which is very interesting, was that uh, Tinubu could not win a uh, Labour state. Mm -hmm. And so when you think that you have uh, an area that you think you control, you could be surprised. Mm -hmm. So that was a very big lesson. Mm -hmm. Two, when people were wondering whether the election was fair or not, mm -hmm. I tend to say that, look, to some extent, it is only fair by the barometer measurement of Lagos State mm -hmm. because uh, Tinubu has strong control over Lagos State. Mm -hmm. So if Tinubu lost Lagos State, mm -hmm. it meant that the right things were being done okay. because if they were really harassing people, mm -hmm. you know, so that they shouldn't vote to make them win as APC, then. Most should have won the state. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Um, so we are told that the turnout, voter turnout, was around 27 percent. Yeah. That should be a surprise. It's a concern. Yes. yes. It, 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 if 27 percent of uh, Nigerians determine who become a president, that is a problem, isn't it? Yes. The, the reason why there was a low turnout was because again, people, especially the youth, are very really disappointed. Apathy. And I think that is what really uh, happened. Mm -hmm. But again, APC might not have won if the uh, cracks within uh, the DP. PDP. PDP. PDP and uh, Labour Party. Yes. Because the PDP. And 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 the PDP. the PDP. And 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 the Atiku Abubakar of the PDP and the Labour Party of Peter Obi to come together is a problem. Yeah, of course, if you sum up their votes. Yeah, together, mm -hmm. they, 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 they were won. Yes. Yeah, they were won. But I'm also still telling uh, the NPP that mm -hmm. we should watch Brazil. Okay. Yes, uh, Luka came back. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> Alright, that, that, that's okay. Um, you've listened to the President at the State of the Nations address. Is there anything you want to comment on? What were your takeaways? Oh, you know, this time the president ran away from microeconomic indicators. Okay. And those were some of the things he used to touch in the previous ones. Uh, talking of city stability, uh, talking of low inflation, uh, monetary, policy. monetary policies, etc. This time he was silent on them and uh, he needed to. And I also thought that before he even started, he should have, he should have apologized to Ghanaians for what? Uh, for saying that, look, I've taken you through difficult times. I told you that, please, I am the best. Uh, try me and see and now look at the kind of economic mess we are going through. Uh, I first want to apologize, but after that, then I will now take you on board that you should support me so that we would uh, move this country. But the writer started by saying that he has not had reckless spending. Uh, how would you score the president on the economy so far, from 2017 up to now? 
Well, I, I think that it's a this now. And uh, I would give him between 35 to 40 percent. Okay. You haven't done well. Uh, but that is a failure. Yes, if of course. If you give him 40 percent, it's a failure. Yes, but that is the, the, the reality on the ground because uh, the rating agencies, Fitch and the rest, have given us the same failure uh, marks. It's not me alone who is saying it. What about the fight against corruption? Oh, uh, that one, uh, it doesn't exist. Mm. Yeah, no, no, no. It's not there. You don't think there is a fight at all? Not at all. There's no fight. Sometimes it's like if you are rather corrupt, they freeze you. But the government thinks that it is under President Abufado that the uh, Office of the Special Prosecutor was uh, put together. And then again, the passage of the RTI, which they continue to doubt. Then uh, you have the Physical Responsibility Act. Yes, so they think that a lot of laws are yes, put in place. Because laws are passed, but if they are not implemented, then they are good laws. They are not good laws. So for me, this fight for corruption um, has been very, very good for years. Uh, government is bringing back road tolls. What's your view? Road tolls. You recall that the road tolls was scrapped ahead of the passage of the e levy bill, and that road toll is coming back. At least I've seen uh, the finance minister writing to the road minister that the toll is coming back. It's yes. Charged. So these are the inconsistencies of this particular government. The, you know, the, the, they just jump into policies that they haven't taken time to look into. And for me, the first day that they were saying they were abolishing the road tolls, I knew that this was going to be a disaster. But I knew it could not be sustained, you know. So it is good that they are coming back to it. But again, they must come and apologize to them. It took a very um, uncalculated uh, decision, you know. And what they did, they were praising themselves. But now that they are going back and it's a failure, they are not coming to apologize to us. But there are those who think that a financial loss has been caused to the state, so the road minister, road and highways minister, should face some sanctions because the the, the road to was scrapped um, just after the bill, the, the budget was read. It was a law and act of parliament. You cannot by the way of that. Oh, yeah, that is true. So, so it, it must go to Parliament mm -hmm. again so that they will look at it. Because anything that is an act, it cannot be a fear by two ministries, uh, rules and then finance. You, you, you recall that the, the scrapping of the road to preceded the e levy. Yeah. What's your view on e levy? Well, so far, the way it was introduced than where we are now. Well, in the right from the one I said, yes, in the way is important, but the rate that they were bringing was what I did not agree with them. Okay. And I was proposing 0 to 5, mm -hmm. you know, but they went up to 1 1.5, 1 1.7. Mm -hmm. So I believe that if they had started gradually with my 0 0.5, you know, I'm sure they would have earned more revenue. And when they went to their work on five months, you know, because I knew that EW was going to bring that ship to smaller holders and to our rural economies where women and traders were always transmitting money. So I didn't want the burden to be very high. I wanted it to be at 0.5%. It has been, been brought from 1.5, 1.50 Yes, so are you satisfied with that? Yeah, why didn't they come back to me to say it was a surprise? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think we need to apologize to you mm -hmm. because you told us and we refused. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you have been around for long and yes. you have witnessed uh, how the late Professor Wesley Boche uh, ruled as a finance minister. You've seen Seth Tekpe, you've seen Kojo uh, Redu and Osafu Mavu and others. How different is Ken Mufuya's style? Yeah, Ken's style to, to, to me is a 
best of all these trends. See, the reason why I'm saying so is not. Uh, the other finance ministers were very, very open. They were ready to listen and they did some bit of consultation. And even in the case of the Secretary, he would even go around the whole country trying to see what the ordinary person's idea is about his budget mm -hmm. so that he will be able to capture the uh, concerns in it. Now when it comes to someone like Osafu Mafo, when I was in Parliament, uh, Osafu Mafo would not be the budget without calling me back then. When I was the record member for finance in Parliament, he would take me through it and say, what do we do? Which are the areas we think that there are concerns? And then we'll look at it, and then we'll debate here and there in a friendly manner before we come to, um, to, to, to Parliament. And we get things like HIPIC, the amounts of HIPIC to me, that the government for a HIPIC program, what do you think about it? And we always had some input um, to it. Even though we may be seen to be fighting in Parliament, but we know that there is some useful agreements. Uh, I can testify that if the budget is to be read on Tuesday, the supplement will be invited on Saturday or Sunday to Akosombo with the uh, Honorable Dr. Tose. And even Barbara we did it once. And then we go and look at it. But we take care of the matter. And I'm working very well. This is my contemporary. Okay. We all came back from, I came from UK, wherever he came from. He landed in this country in 1990. We were all ruling MPA in finance. Okay? And I was with Equal Bank and he started it up. I've been very close to him. When I was Deputy Finance Minister, I consulted him on some issues, including the listing of Ashanti Goldfields Corporation on the London and other stock exchange. We used to invite him to the castle and Rollins whom they think is not a Democrat, who was the president, and he would come to an honorable public program, he was the Minister of Finance, and he would come and make his input as to how we can manage the listing of Ashanti Group Fields. Ask him whether since he came, he has ever called me on the phone to say, Moses, how are you? What do you think? Are you, honorable, are you confirming that? Ever since the Ken of Riata became the finance minister, he has never had any conversation about the financial all. issues. Not at all. Even the friendship that we used to have mm -hmm. at family level. Uh, the only time I would be the reason. Of course, you know, they think they know it all. Yes. And, and when that happens, that's when we are now. Yes. And <laughs> Maybe you'll call me after the IMF. Maybe, you know, talking the IMF on, on, on city TV, I said he should put aside arrogance mm -hmm. and then go for IMF. And, you know, so I know you yeah, predicted. So it's not like we don't know one another. And I've been putting this. Look, we all go to the same secondary schools. Mm -hmm. We all at the same time in being in school. We all did everything. Why do you think where you are coming from some sky that your your knowledge from every other person. I mean, we're all there. Yeah. So, do you think the time has come for um, the economic management team and the finance minister to cross the political divide and say, let's have some economic dialogue like we did in Semchi, for instance? Yes, we, we did it in Semchi. Mm -hmm. We invited them. The most of them didn't come, except for the part uh, and a few others who came. But this has been mentioned to them, but they will not come out clearly to invite you to a real good city. Mm -hmm. you know. If they do it, definitely we will attend. And um, you know, uh, for example, Sir Tepper, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, he, he was the one leading the session. Mm -hmm. Yes. So anyway, he was a former deputy finance minister former Minister for Employment and Labor Relations, former CEO of National Petroleum Authority, 
former MP for Nabdam constituency and economics, a former member of the board of uh, former board member of Bank of Ghana. Uh, Honorable Musi Sasaga is my guest. Uh,